Welcome to Carpool Chats, a podcast brought to you by the Fuels Institute. Hey everybody, welcome back to Carpool Chats. I'm John Eichberg with the Fuels Institute. And today we are actually gonna kind of do a quick flashback. I think one of our first episodes ever was talking about the oil markets. And it seems like on a cycle, things happen. Everything changes. Every time you turn around, something's going on. We've got record setting uh, oil prices here in the first quarter of 2022. Um, things we haven't seen in a long, long time, record setting gasoline prices. So we brought on two of our board members Stephen Jones with Argus Media and Denton Cinquagrana with Oil Price Information Service to talk about what's going on in the oil and petroleum markets. Um, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. My pleasure. So I guess the first question, Denton, let me throw you the softball. What's going on? I mean, <laughs> it wasn't too long ago we were talking about negative trading in the oil markets. And now we're, you know, today we're under 100, but we've been above $100 a barrel again. I mean, what, what flipped sure. the switch? Yeah, so I mean, a lot of it can point back to the Russia, U, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But again, we were on a little bit of a, a crash course for at least a maybe a brush with triple digits before all that was taking place. So that just kind of put us over the top, and now it's probably, you know, amongst the m- multiple wild cards out there, probably the biggest one right now. Uh, obviously, the, the U.S. sanctions of of, of Russian crude oil and Russian products was mostly symbolic. I think the market did a lot of the dirty work for for the president and the Biden administration by banks not issuing issuing letters of credit, shipping companies not willing to move it. So they did all the dirty work. But now we're at a point where, okay, that's mostly symbolic. What happens next if, say, Europe, which obviously needs the Russian molecules, uh, kind of follows through and does the same thing, then we turn the page into a whole new whole new ball game. So yes, we're down right now, but we could be back up in a matter of you know days if that if something like that happens again. Yeah. Stephen, what are you thinking? Well, I I agree with Denton. I mean, we were already in a uh, market situation where supply was lagging the rate of demand recovery. You know, post COVID, if you will, if we want to call it that, <clears throat> post lockdowns and true reopening of the economy. We were already starting to see demand outpace the rate of OPEC adding 400,000 barrels a day, month on month, back to the market. The issue was they weren't even meeting that full 400,000 barrel a day target while demand was outstripping it. And so the market was already getting anxious. And then with the Ukrainian conflict, you know, the it, it just put it on steroids. It just blew it out. And, you know, the... The market was reacting to that exposure for what could happen to supply interruptions. And I think the reality is, and the reason prices came off, is that there hasn't really been a true supply curtailment. There's been supply trading interruptions, but the barrels haven't come off the market. Matter of fact, the Russian loading program has still continued uh, so far. Uh, The issues that Denton raised are spot on. You know, the the financial sector put sanctions in place and made it hard for any trade activity to and from Russia to occur, but there's still barrels moving to some extent and production, as far as most people see, hasn't been cut out yet. Uh, And I think the bid up to the record high, recent record high prices were really on the tail of the U S announcement of sanctions. Oh dear, what's Russia going to, or what's Europe going to do? Is Europe going to follow suit immediately or not? And, you know, quickly, uh, it came out that, yeah, may, but not till the end of the year, if then. And so quickly it deflated that sense of uh, an immediate real disruption and prices have normalized back to the upper range, as didn't mention we were heading towards, due to the, the pre-conflict supply-demand imbalance. Our views, you know, when we ran the analytics and the, the outlook, were that eventually the supply was going to keep this pace up with OPEC increases, and the rate of demand growth was already going to begin slowing pre-conflict due to supply chain problems, inflationary tendencies, and the fact that we had already recovered a good portion of the demand since COVID. Uh, so you can visualize a tapering of the rate of increasing demand and supply eventually catching up to normalize and allow for potential re-inventory, restocking uh, that would still put prices in the 
you know, on an oil base, crude oil basis in the, you know, mid to low 80s, potentially by the end of this year into next. Obviously, now it's game over. Who knows uh, until we really see what kind of supply interruptions might manifest itself. So, Dan, I mean, if Stephen's right, we're not, we're not seeing a shortage, a reduction in supply. Why are we seeing the prices go up? I guess it really comes down to the, the base question that everybody's asking is, who sets the price of oil? And I think there's a lot of mis, misinterpretation, misunderstanding out there of how the price is set. Can you kind of walk us through how the price of oil is actually determined? Yeah, sure. I mean, it starts at the New York Mercantile Exchange, owned by the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the CMA. That's where the futures market's trading. If you've seen the scene in J- trading places with the frozen concentrate orange juice, <laughs> uh, that's where the price is there. And John, I knew that would have been right up your alley, so that's why I threw that one in there. For so you have now again, it's not guys yelling back and forth at each other anymore. Uh, not that organized chaos that was just always fun to watch, but it's all electronic now. Part of the argument now, or at least the observation, is that a lot of this stuff is getting done electronically, and it's just momentum carrying and, and, and following. It's the whole the FOMO and the you know the money chasing money uh, idea of it. But okay, so you start there. Most physical oil is traded as a differential to that West Texas intermediate price or that Brent price. And that's usually how some contracts are sent and set and how, you know, oil gets into the various pipelines, et cetera, and gets to the refiners or to the export markets. So it's traders. So it's I mean, traders. The, the, <clears throat> a lot of different pieces along, along the way that, that sets the price of oil. Uh, what we had was just basically the fear of not enough. Um, and now w- what's kind of happened here, it's almost coming full circle where the exchanges have to protect themselves because we don't want to see a situation in, in the oil markets like we saw with the London Metals Exchange where the nickel uh, markets were shut down for several days because of just high volatility. So the CMA and, and the Intercontinental Exchange, the ICE, they're raising all the margin requirements to kind of play in the sandbox, if you will. So with higher margins comes less market participation, which you can make the argument brings about more volatility even. So these wild swings that we've been seeing over the last couple of weeks, I I, I don't see how they they go away other than maybe Vladimir Putin wakes up and says, oh my God, what happened with this horrible dream I was having? I I attacked Ukraine. And someone says, you did. And he's like, okay, let's let's stop that. I don't think that's going to happen. But (laughs) I mean, that's kind of what would really cool off the markets right now and bring those margins back so we can have kind of the normal flow of participation. Also, you know, one more point to that, and Stephen, I'm sorry, I'm no, taking up all the time here, but, uh, <laughs> but also, you know, you've had the, the, the phrase capital discipline from, from producers, and they have not been ready to rush in and just produce and, and crash the market like they have done in the past. So at the same time, you don't have that class, the producers, not not the Broadway play or, you know, the, the Mel Brooks movie, uh, selling into the market to hedge and lock in prices. So you're missing that element as well right now. So a lot of different moving pieces that are that are setting the market, but we saw prices go up, you know, thirty, forty dollars and then drop thirty, forty dollars. It's you know, John, you know I've been doing this for a long time and uh, never seen anything like this. Yeah, it is. Uh, I remember when I first got into this business, if the oil markets moved two or two to five dollars in a day, people thought, holy cow, oh, yeah. look at the movement. And now it's just yeah. That's just a yawner now. It moves five dollars today. Yeah, yeah, it'll come back. You know, no big deal. I, I, um, will, just, I won't hate yeah, myself because uh, if it moved a quarter of fifty cents in my day, it was like something's broken. <laughs> I, was, I remember, you know, on the refined product side, on the gasoline and, and diesel side, you know, a, a penny, two cents. You know, that was that was a big move. Now it moves that in three minutes. Yeah, it's it's crazy. And, you know, Stephen, when we think about it, you know, the media is is always all over increasing energy prices, politicians as well. So we've had some releases from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. We've had calls to suspend the gas tax. We've got calls to impose windfall profits tax on oil companies. We have all of these proposals coming out. 
under the cloak of let's help the customer. I mean, <clears throat> we talked to bring, on, bring in an oil from Venezuela. We're talking about trying to encourage more production domestically. I mean, where do we go? I mean, if we haven't seen a significant change in supply availability yet, um, what are the options available to us with the exception of Putin waking up from a Yeah, I think, nightmare? you know, the examples you cite, they're very real that have been kicked around in the political circles and and been visited even in person, like, you know, visits to Venezuela to see what can be done. Uh, you know, revisiting the Iran nuclear situation to see if uh, an agreement can be reached, which has been derailed twice now. <laughs> Uh, there are a lot of, I don't know what you'd say, uh, long, long bomb passes trying to figure out if there's something to really shore up the supply side concerns. And, you know, trying to add consumer relief by, you know, tax relief policies or things of that nature is just a short term, you know, uh, factor. It, it's you may as well rip the Band-Aid off at some point and let it play through uh, from a try it all strategy. The only real thing that's going to work is price. Price will eventually slow the demand and allow the supply side to find that balance and allow prices to begin to ease once that becomes evident to the market. Most everything we've talked about here in this conversation has been market sentiment and hasn't really been a true interruption yet. It's a concern around supply being lost with demand continuing its current trajectory. Demand under these high prices and the inflationary pressures we're seeing is apt to slow. If we stay above $100 a barrel, it's going to take a hit to global GDP and slow energy requirements due to the economy cooling. Now, the U.S. consumers, as we've all three talked about before, you know, price elasticity in the U.S. for gasoline is almost non-existent historically. You know, we, we blew through $4 a gallon retail you know, how high does it have to get? Six bucks before we start seeing true consumer behavior in the U.S. change? Well, that's not the way the rest of the world works. And already there are countries that have fixed product prices where their demand hasn't been affected yet. And yet they're buying imported oil at international price levels and their, their coffers, their basically reserves of cash are being drawn down because they're paying international price oil and allowing their consumers to buy gasoline and diesel and whatnot at their internally fixed number. Eventually that has to change and then you begin to see demand grow slow. China and Asia broadly is the larger consuming center of the entire globe. And already you've got literally tens of millions of people about to go through lockdown with the current COVID re, re, uh, you know, contamination, the virus potentially spreading. And, and it's not like the open market where we live and enjoy the Western world lifestyle where you can't put the genie back in the bottle. You know, I doubt we could make most Americans go back into full lockdown mode like we experienced back in 2000. And, and the high prices hasn't curtailed the demand, but the rest of the world will slow some demand if prices persist and allow that balance. Now, where can other supply come from? It's not going to come from Venezuela. You know, they had the, you know, the expertise vacate the country. They haven't had capitalization investment to restore the facilities and have producibility even available in years of, of time frame, let alone the need for now. Uh, from other supply sources, it's it's not going to be the U.S. producers. The capital discipline from the financial sector that warrants a return for investment without the certainty that these prices are sustainable for the duration of that capital deployment. I mean, am I going to get paid for spending this money on just trying to help uh, solve a prompt market supply concern that hadn't, again, happened fully yet? Isn't, isn't going to be the solution or the pathway. If it's viewed as a sustainable high price level, you know, in the 80 to 90 plus dollar range ad infinitum, yeah, we'll start to see the drilling come back and other things. But keep in mind the U.S. drilling sector is seeing the same inflationary cost pressures that we are in the grocery store and at the pump. It's costing them more to operate. And are you going to deploy capital in that type of market environment to chase pricing 
in light of all the, you know, uh, climate change initiatives and other things that you have to deal with, uh, you have to have certainty of payback. And that's, uh, that discipline's, I think, well exerted at this point. So Dan, that brings two things to my mind. One, you know, Stephen talked about Venezuela, Iran, we talked about Russia. What about Canada? Why they? Why can't we bring in more oil from Canada? Um, he talked about <clears throat> there's a lot of hesitancy on an increasing domestic production because of the need to return on capital to the investors. Um, all those things come into it, but at the same time, we're in a situation where we're looking at the price of oil is not necessarily being driven by an actual physical supply constraint. It's the fear of a future supply constraint. Would signals like opening up the U.S. to more Canadian imports, would that create more of a calming effect on the markets and provide some relief long term? I think it probably would. And obviously that goes to the possibly the biggest football, political football out there right now is the Keystone Pipeline. Uh, I don't think it gets finished. Obviously, I think it's it's a, it's a non-starter at this point. Uh, but again, and this is my own personal theory. Uh, this is not the the opinion of Opus. But honestly, if more Canadian crude came from the not built, uh, finished or not finished Canadian, uh, at Keystone XL, that oil would just go right down to the Gulf of Mexico, get on a ship, and get exported. So while yes. Importing more from Canada would be good, but I think we're just about pretty much maxed out of what we could do. Probably more trains. Uh, we saw what happened with with crude by rail, you know, several years ago when there was that unfortunate accident where a train exploded and, and you know killed a bunch of people in, in a town. Um, again, these are you know one offs. They don't happen all the time, but right. you increase right. the risk with that. But again, we're importing quite a bit from uh, from Canada already, roughly in the 3 million barrels a day area, according to the EIA. And also to, to Stephen's point about the US producers, one, you don't just snap your finger and more oil come, or wave a magic wand and more, more oil comes out, of the mar comes out of the ground. It takes time, it takes several months. Plus, you know, he mentioned the inflationary pressures that, that they're facing. There's also labor shortages there as well. So we, we've heard about it all over with everything. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, got the pleasure of seeing uh, Pank Farmer speak at uh, an event. And he was talking about the convenience store industry of how they're suffering with, with labor shortages, significant labor shortages. So it's no different there than a lot of other industries. But also, you know, again, to, to Stephen's point, and he, he, was, he was saying this, the conversation is not necessarily turned from increasing supply. It's turned to how do we destroy demand? And $4 gasoline in 2022 is a lot different than $4 gasoline in 2008, the last time we were above $4, when you consider wage inflation, et cetera. So where is that pain point? I think we kind of found it a little bit when we got up to about 4.30, 4.35 nationally. California's laughing at everyone saying, 4.30, I'm <laughs> 4.30. But, uh, you know, again, it, it's one of those things we're, we're fine. I think we're starting to find that that 4.30 number might be that pain point. Uh, so, you know, again, it's one of those things where, where time will tell, obviously, but, you know, I, I think we're, we're, we're working through that. Okay. Supply is not necessarily increasing. There's not really a need to increase supply as much as some think out there. So now we got to go to the process of, of destroying demand. It's a painful process, but you know, we're going to, we're going to end up finding out. I think, I think then that's spot on. I mean, the key question is where does that demand get destroyed? And there's no doubt that, we as American consumers feel the pain in our wallet. The question is, is it painful enough to change our behavior? Um, and, right. and I guess, you know, even as we were racing towards the current high retail prices just recently experienced, uh, you know, all indications were still that demand was still moving upward. Um, so we're, we may be getting close to that pain point, but I think it's going to have to be a pretty remarkable number for U.S. gasoline to be affected. But that being said, the rest of the world doesn't operate that way. And there is, you know, even if the demand begins to revert in terms of the support for growth from high price pressures, the market's going to have to be convinced that that is allowing a rebalance or allowing excess supply to become apparent and appearing in stock levels around the world. The OECD market, the developed economies of the world that carry inventory, have been pretty much at record lows for gasoline and uh, distillate primarily. 
And, and so with the market price time structure for people that aren't familiar with that, the Ford period for the price of oil is much, much lower than even the escalated prices we went through. And operators cannot afford to carry inventory and rebuild stocks and hold on to that in inventory to cover for a supply interruption if the market price time structure isn't flatter. So if I buy oil today at 130 and it dropped like it did to sub 100 and I built a barrel, I just lost 30 plus dollars a barrel by holding on to it during that time period. And so there has to be a flattening of the curve. So either the outward price and sentiment needs to come up or the prompt period needs to get comfortable that there's not going to be a future supply disruption or that demand is slowing and it will correct itself. Last time we talked about flattening the curve, Stephen, we entered a massive drop in oil prices and demand. So let's not let's stay away from these trigger words like that. Um, but I also want to think back, you know, last time we got to the four dollar gallon gasoline, 140, 150 dollar barrel oil, it was 2008. And six months later, oil was down in the 20s and 30s. Gasoline was down in the in the one dollar yeah. range. Um, you know, didn't you talk about demand destruction? Nothing kills demand like a recession. Um, and I, yep. we're not going to get predictability here. I don't want to be forecasting anything here, but man, that, that scares me. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. That's, a, that's the scary thing. And while, you know, the, the mainstream media and the business media, especially will focus on crude oil, uh, local TV stations, local newspapers, they're going to focus on gasoline. It's the consumer facing product. What no one is really talking about, maybe us nerds here is <clears throat> diesel. And that's what scares me right now. I mean, the fact that diesel prices are so high, it's going to keep that inflation. The trucks are going to have to continue to issue these fuel surcharges. That's going to keep prices elevated, inflation elevated. And that's that's what, in my opinion, would potentially tip us towards that, that R word. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think 2008 is... Some of the factors that we saw in 2008 are comparable to the current circumstance, but the analogy's a little misinformed to some extent. 2008, we had demand growth on fire, pulling on supply that wasn't there, uh, that propagated price to the point. And then we had the Great Recession, which was really precipitated by financial markets and other things, as opposed to just merely high energy prices. We're in a whole different set of basic financial fundamentals now. You know, we have prices driven because supply uncertainty as demand's been measuredly recovering as opposed to being on fire and supply can't keep up with it. It's the threat of an interruption. But I think Denton <clears throat> nailed it is that, you know, we are exposed to inflationary pressures that could slow the economy that therefore kills demand. And we have to keep in mind that it's not just fuel, but it's food. With this crisis in Ukraine, they're missing the planting season. Wheat season is enormous for the feeding the, you know, that whole part of the world and beyond. And we could have tremendous inflationary pressures uh, due to the loss of harvest when it comes time, because we hadn't planted, there's nothing to harvest. And the fuel requirements to plant and harvest are now more expensive on top of that. And so you could end up with, you know, a, a rapid inflationary pressure if some of these factors can't be clarified or resolved soon. Um, and we're in the middle of where this crisis ends and what shape it leaves the world in, in general. And that is a very real exposure. And the, the underlying demand growth just merely from COVID, COVID's not contained yet. And, uh, and for part of the world, yeah. like I said just previously, not to be repetitive, they, they have the latitude to just telling everyone and demanding everyone stay home and like other parts of the world. And that's where the demand growth was assumed and already trending to occur. So we've got two or three main headwinds to deal with on the demand side that no matter what happens on the supply side, it starts to soften the balance. So everything I've heard so far kind of comes down to this, that we don't have a supply challenge right now. We have fear of supply challenge, which is driving the contracts up. 
you know, Denton years ago, there was a strong push on behalf of some in the fuel marketing industry to get put some constraints on speculative investments in the oil markets. Um, and then market traders I spoke to said, look, it's price discovery. You know, you have to have discovery and that's why you have these positions. Is there any type of concern that the market is reacting in this fear of the future in a way that may not be reflective of what the market really is dealing with? Or is it truly just, look, they're looking at all the potential variables and trying to bake in prices based on what they think the future is going to be. I mean, is that legit or are we in an area where there may be a, a reason for some concern? Yeah, no. And again, it, it goes back to, you know, the, that old phrase, the market is the market, right? And like, you know, price discovery, et cetera. Uh, there have been some limitations put in place to reduce excessive speculation. But one of the things that I've been, you know, kind of keeping an eye on, this is maybe a little too inside baseball, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll kind of break it down and try and make it as easily as understandable as possible. But every week, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission puts out data on people trading futures positions. It could be nickel, it could be hot aluminum aluminum, and, and rolled steel and oats and whatever. But watching the diesel one, and again, I, I just keep staying on the diesel train here. Um, you know, you have your, your money managers, your hedge funds, your ETFs, et cetera, et cetera, those that are trading on behalf of well-heeled clients. But then you have this also, also this other category called non-reportables. These are like if the three of us pooled our money together and said, hey, let's buy some ULSD futures, right? Be the stupidest thing we've ever done. Uh, and I've done some stupid things in my life. But anyway, uh, <laughs> the amount of uh, open interest, so positions that are open and have not been closed uh, amongst that cat class of trade is almost 16% of the entire long side of it. They, they own these diesel futures and options contracts right now. That, you know, just to put it in perspective, that's a lot, you know, it's, it's, you know, almost one fifth of the entire market when you consider there's producers in there, there's hedge funds in there. And then you have the, the little, little guys, the doctors, lawyers, fire chiefs who are, uh, who, who have almost 20% of this market. And I think in the pullback, the, the pretty massive pullback that we've seen over the last several days, that's the group that probably got hit the hardest. Those are the ones who got the margin calls and you know had to liquidate and, and et cetera et cetera so i don't think anything i think some of the sentiment has changed that it's maybe not going to be as bad as like steven was saying that we haven't really seen any real supply interruptions already i think what happened in the in the grand scheme of things was okay yeah the u.s gets you know one two three percent of their oil from russia but at the end of the day it's still a global market and at the end of the day there's the potential for three to four million barrels a day of, of oil availability from Russia that could be off the market yeah, at some point. I, I think that's an excellent point that we ought to confirm for or clarify for our listeners. When we say so there haven't been supply interruptions, that means basically we haven't been able to identify oil being cut back in the ground or, or unable to move out of storage immediately. What we are seeing, though, are trade interruptions and disconnects between markets. Yeah. And that is very real. And those interruptions between trade regions add tremendous cost to the cost of doing business and therefore the cost and therefore the price we see at the pump. And so even though we're saying the market supply hasn't been affected, the trade and therefore the movement of barrels or gallons into a given region is seeing higher cost structure to ultimately fulfill that demand. And the cost of freight's been escalated, the cost of trade, uh, who you can do business with. As we said at the front end of the, the visit, you know, letters of credit and the financial institutions and others, many people are having to underwrite it themselves instead of the conventional way of trading. High risk, high cost, the price goes up. So we're in a, a regime of higher price operability, despite the fact, and I think we're all in agreement, there hadn't truly been an apparent supply disruption. There are major changes in trade patterns that are affecting the cost structure. Europe, you know, the price of diesel 
in Europe relative to the cost of crude is so wide or was so wide during the peak, and the U.S. didn't follow suit in the same spread. It went up, but not same proportionality. Same thing with gasoline. Gasoline has basically been in the dump in Europe, and yet it's been strong here. You know, there, there are major dichotomies between the refining operating cost and the trading uh, requirements and expenses that will create large gaps in pricing between shores. And that's affecting and, and allowing for the supply that is available to get where it needs to be. Who has it? Who wants it? Who gets it? And at what price? And, uh, you know, when Europe's running 60% refinery capacity, meaning they have lots of upside to process more, but their cost of natural gas is like equivalent to $50 MBTU compared to our $5 per MBTU price here. You can't afford to boil the oil there and, uh, and meet the demand for distillate. And if natural gas gets cut off to Germany and they have to burn more fuel oil, up goes the price of diesel. It bid up all gas oil prices. <clears throat> Whereas in the U.S., we, we have enough extra diesel that we're shipping into Latin America. Uh, so, and we're running 90% utilization with economies of scale and refining, cheap operating cost, and so, and water frontage to take in a variety of crude and so forth. So, it really comes down to the trade being grossly interrupted, despite there not being any supply disruptions yet. Uh, the incremental supply can come out of the Middle East for refining to provide diesel and gas oils and whatnot to Europe. Um, India has already shifted trade patterns to provide diesel towards Europe, and it takes a price to bid it away uh, to allow a new equilibrium to be sought in the market. And that's what we're dealing with right now. So I just want to make clear that, you know, there are high cost structures that we're all dealing with in the market that aren't going to be easily relieved. There's no magic bullet here to solve a lot of the supply exposures and trade uh, stresses that we're seeing in the, in the overall price structure in the marketplace right now. And I think that's key. And gentlemen, I really appreciate you joining us today. I mean, there is no silver bullet. There is no um, easy fix. We're going to have to ride this out. My hope is because I think what I've heard is stability breeds confidence, breeds rebalancing in the system. Um, I really hope that I don't have you guys back on in a couple of months to talk about a massive drop in oil prices. We don't want them to be $150, but we also don't want to lose 60 bucks in what's currently in there because that's, that signals a completely different problem. Um, so let's cross your fingers that we get some stability. We get some indicators in the global economy that things are going the right direction and um, <clears throat> we have some predictability in the market so that we can get uh, some relief to the pump to the consumers. I think ultimately we can predict more effectively what the future markets look like. That stabilizes the market and that will help the consumer to pump. So, uh, Denton, Stephen, thank you guys very much. Thank you for everything you do for the Fuel Institute and for joining us on uh, Carpool Chats. Talk to you guys next time in the next episode.